Thank you. What a pleasure, what a pleasure just to listen so far today, much less to take a minute to talk. Um, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna talk about uh, three unlikely places to find a spark in life, uh, not odd, odd places, decidedly low tech, and largely illegal as well. Um, <laughs> the first of these is trespass. And let me start with the most uh, unusual place you might think that would that create a spark, which would be a sign actually dedicated to snuffing out sparks. Uh, this is a no trespassing sign in a shopping center parking lot uh, near where I live in Texas. Uh, here's a highlighted version. You can see that it actually dis dis dissuades you from almost anything that you might enjoy, uh, consuming an alcoholic beverage, soliciting, hanging out with friends, skateboarding, bicycling, skating, uh, et cetera. So here we have a sign that is designed to limit drastically human possibility and to confine it within a set of rules and regulations designed to protect this uh, private shopping space. Now, one problem you can see all right away is that by the time I'm close enough to read the sign, I've already violated uh, the no bicycle injunction. <laughs> so I have now begun the process of dealing with the implications of a kind of world governed by uh, these sorts of signs. Now, getting close to this sign, and this is truly how this happened, the first time I saw the sign, I was astounded by how thoroughgoing its set of prohibitions were. And it reminded me of a concept that uh, sociologists like myself and criminologists think a lot about, and that is what's happened to public space. Uh, we imagine we still live in the same society we lived in 50 or 100 years ago. We don't imagine that technologically. But we imagine our cities are still similar. In fact, I would like to argue they're not. Uh, the town square has often been replaced by a privately developed town square. Uh, the shopping area, uh, open shopping, replaced by a shopping mall, which is privatized. Um, some of my research, park benches that now disincline one from sitting, closed restrooms so that you don't hang around parks. We see the erosion of the public sphere, which I would argue is essential to democracy and the closing of private space. So one thing that I see in this sign is actually a very dangerous trend toward the sort of hyper-regulation of our lives together when we're out of our homes and sharing space. Second thing, as you might suspect by being on the bicycle, I'm an ardent bicyclist, not only because I love to bicycle, but because I think it is time that we confront the damage done by the automobile, uh, the high pollution levels, uh, the, the sedentary lifestyles that it spawns. And so to see a sign that lumps bicycling in with loitering and drinking uh, strikes me as inappropriate at best and perhaps even uh, uh, damnable in its implications. So I uh, begin to consider this sign and consider <laughs> uh, upon closer uh, review uh, that this also raises an issue that we as sociologists talk a lot about, which is the idea of transgression. Uh, now transgression is not, not dissimilar to trespass, but a little bit different. And that is transgression suggests not just violating the rules, but if you know your Latin or Greek roots, as I'm sure many of you do here at Carnegie Mellon, uh, it suggests a kind of crossing over, a crossing past boundaries. And so transgression, of course, can be a, a terrible thing, it can be crossing past boundaries of decency or morality, or transgression can be a very positive thing if what needs to be crossed is a barrier or something that is keeping us from progressing. And so in that sense, certainly Martin Luther King was a transgressor. Certainly Gandhi transgressed against the British Empire. Uh, her recent statue put up in Washington, D.C. Certainly Rosa Parks uh, made the decision to transgress and cross over the boundaries of where one was allowed to sit in a bus. And so again, continue to consider the sign. I'm considering not only the nature of public space, the nature of being a bicyclist, but the broader issues that we confront in our lives as to when rules are made and why, and what our duty is as citizens in terms of obeying those rules out of decency and morality, or at times perhaps going past, crossing over into an area uh, beyond those rules. And so in this case, my decision was... <laughs> Uh, since I'd already violated the sign by being on a bicycle, let's go ahead and uh, confront the implications of the sign further. So um, I returned. I, I looked for a skateboard, but I couldn't find it. I've tried. I, this I could do was a bicycle and a bottle of beer. And so uh, I and a friend returned to uh, confront this sign, which you may have noticed, by the way, actually prohibits it on either side of the sign. It's a very, very thoroughgoing uh, sign. And so in this last frame, you can see that the satisfaction actually is not from drinking the beer, although it's a good local Texas brew that I would recommend, uh, but actually from understanding that there are times, in fact, that the spark of, of creativity can come from confronting that which limits us, and not to take signs too seriously, not to take prohibitions too seriously, and to think for ourselves that there are times, in fact, not to transgress, but perhaps there are times to transgress uh, for some larger uh, reason. 
Uh, before I go on to trash, uh, I want to summarize that, by the way, with, uh, I would argue that's part of our culture as Americans uh, that we tend to forget, and that is, uh, I'll, I'll say it in a way that's far better than I can say it, Woody Guthrie, the great American troubadour, folk singer, and protest singer, his best known song is, uh, This Land is Your Land. But we only tend to hear the sanitized version of that song. And there are verses he sang on the road in the 30s that were recorded by the Lomaxes and others, but are almost never heard today. And I'd like to close this part with, uh, with a verse from Woody Guthrie. As I went walking, I saw a sign there. And on that sign, it said, no trespassing. But on the other side, it didn't say nothing. That side was made for you and me. <laughs> that side may be where the spark is uh, as well. So uh, let me be, uh, go on to another prohibition. And this is a, the side of a dumpster. Uh, the sign's been there a while as dumpsters tend to decay. But you can see the sign prohibits climbing on or entering uh, the dumpster. And as usual, <laughs> um, I'm in, actually entering the dumpster. Uh, as was suggested, I uh, have been a dumpster diver all my life. For those of you in grad school, this would be a friendly uh, piece of advice. It began when my stipend didn't cover my living expenses in graduate school. <laughs> and uh, I began to dumpster dive and found that a way to supplement my income. I also like the environmental aspects of this, of keeping things out of the waste stream. I like the adventure of it because as a dumpster diver, you never know uh, what you may find. And so uh, for about a year, I actually resigned a professorship and went back to the streets and lived exclusively from what I found in dumpsters and wrote the book Empire Scrounge about this. And what I found were two things. One was the phenomenal amount of waste that consumer capitalism generates, that in a sense it is our decision, it is our choice, but in a way it's not. That with each new iPhone, with each change in hemlines or lapel widths or baggy pants or straight leg pants, uh, that of course the previous generation of products gets thrown away and gets thrown away faster and faster. And so what I found, and I continue to dumpster dive daily, uh, is not just trash in a sort of abstract sense, but actually things that are not trash at all. Wearable clothes that I now take to the shelters in my community, uh, edible food that I take to the food bank, tools, uh, about half of what I'm wearing right now is dumpster dive. I'll leave it to you to figure out which half uh, <laughs> comes from the dumpsters. But uh, as I begin to do this research, I realized something else as well in living on the streets, that I, of course, was hardly the first one to figure this out. And that to write the book, the reason the book is called Empire of Scrounge, was because there's actually an empire of people out there living off the trash. There are homeless folks, of course. There are minimum wage workers who come back to work to supplement their family income. There are environmentalists. There are artists who scrounge art materials for sculptures and, and uh, found object art from the trash. I found a, a United Nations of recent immigrants who came to the United States but without a green card, without a social security number, now live out of the trash. And this photo is a photo of uh, a fellow I got to know who was a bottle collector and hope so pushed a cart around eight or ten hours a day collecting bottles to return. Uh, and so again, the, the trash is both us in a, in, a, in a broad sense of consumerism, but there are many of us living from it uh, as well. Now, this is something I found uh, about a year ago. This is a mid-century modern pink sink uh, from the trash. And so that suggests something else as well, that of course trash is not befouled necessarily. It also may simply be, in the classic anthropological phrase, things that have lost their way, things that have gotten lost along in our lives. And so here was a sink on the way to the landfill. As a lover of mid-century modern style, uh, I felt compelled to, to save the sink. Uh, here's another suggestion of what might be there in the trash. This is the side of a, uh, a dumpster in Vancouver, British Columbia. Here's a piece of art, a piece of graffiti art that over the years has rusted through. So I especially like the sort of decaying aesthetic of that as well. So in a, in a further irony, this suggests that trash actually may be a place to look for beauty. And here I want to show you some shots. I uh, spent some years in my life earlier uh, as a graffiti writer uh, and writing a book about graffiti. I learned, among other things, including how to run from the police, uh, how, to handle a, how to handle a spray can, uh, how to create effects with a spray can. If, uh, more on that, as, if you like, later. Uh, but what I began to do when I went back to dumpster diving was to think that those two worlds, as others have talked about, might come together. And so the, this is art that I make uh, from scrounged spray paint and scrounged objects that I then use as stencils. So these are some uh, pieces of metal and wire that I discovered. Uh, this next one, this, these are actually pieces from a construction site. These are pieces of wall, uh, wall interiors and a metal grating to construct roofs that have been made into art. And this is a, actually a piece of fencing and some of the strings that come off of Venetian blinds, we disassemble them into their aluminum parts. Uh, so here's the possibility again of even creating beauty perhaps uh, from that which others discard. But most interestingly to me is the, are these next images. And that is that over the, over the past decade or so, I've scrounged literally thousands 
of discarded photographs. So when elderly parents die and the children don't want the photos, when someone's life runs out, when a family is dissolved, uh, when a divorce occurs, at times of sorrow or loss, often memories get tossed away as well. And I find these photos tremendously powerful, not only some of them actually very interesting compositions, but also by what they tell us about our lives. I remember back in high school, my Latin uh, teacher, Sic Transit Gloria Mundi, right? So passes the glory of the world. Well, so passes the glory of our lives as we end up perhaps inevitably uh, discarded. So here's a child in 1966. I love this photo, uh, uh, motoring around on his scooter. Uh, here's a, a young woman uh, from the, I would guess the 40s or 50s by the quality of the photo. Perhaps she's now in her 60s, perhaps she still dances. Here she is learning uh, the movements of, of dance. Um, these next three I, I especially like because these are all three scrounged in Texas. So remember that before I show them to you. And I think they also are fascinating commentaries on human interaction, uh, affection, gender roles, all that. So let me show you the first one. Uh, uh, by the way, let me go back. That's, there's actually a lovely found photo of someone's vacation. Um, but here is one that reminds us, this apparently is from the 1910, 1920 period, that gangster poses aren't new to hip hop. <laughs> uh, that crotches were being grabbed and poses were being struck long before uh, hip hop. So here, here are a couple of uh, Texas cowboys, uh, uh, bad, bad seeds posing in front of a porch. Uh, this one I especially love. I, I, I would, I, I'm fascinated by this photo. This strikes me as a classic uh, example of, you know, sort of good old boy machismo mixed with a kind of broke back mountain tenderness. I, I, I'm quite serious. I mean, I, that's a very interesting photo to try to understand in terms of their relationship, but it's, I find it a beautiful photo. And this, I just want to show you, these would be uh, good old boys. If you've not been to Texas, uh, these would be two good old boys uh, who are playing with a rattlesnake. So that tells you something about Texas culture as well. So the spark to me is to realize that in fact, perhaps that which we label trash is not trash. In fact, it may have beauty and meaning, and perhaps the people that we label as trash also have dignity and knowledge and beauty uh, to their lives as well. Now, the last thing I want to wrap up by talking about are trains, and I believe we're now going to, there we go, I'll let you look at these videos. Uh, there's also a hidden world out there of train hoppers, and this is also to me part of American history, uh, the history of hobos. After the, after the Civil War in the United States, workers began to ride the trains, those who had been displaced by the war. That's how the West was con conquered or settled, depending on your point of view. And so the trains became the way in which the impoverished or the marginalized uh, traveled the world. This has been handed down from generations, but was in danger of dying out a couple of decades ago when, of all things, a new subculture emerged, which is the subculture of gutter punks. And gutter punks are uh, a spinoff uh, from the punk subculture of the 80s and 90s. Street kids who live on the street ride trains in order to get around uh, and live entirely then a kind of drifting mobile lifestyle. Uh, one day, a few months ago, while on the streets, dumpster diving, I met a kid who was just out of jail, who was a dumpster diver and a drifter and a gutter punk. I helped him out, we got to know each other, and as you can see here, I ended up riding the freight trains with him, hopping freight trains. Uh, we hopped a train in Fort Worth that took us to Abilene after a few hours. We got stuck in Abilene, had to dodge the, the railroad police, bought a six pack, drank it in Abilene, caught another train to Sweetwater, it started raining, bought another six pack, ate some cold beans on the ground, slept under a shed, missed the next train. It was about three in the morning, half drunk in the yards of Sweetwater, that I realized what he'd been trying to tell me about drift is that drift is the moment in which you find yourself by letting yourself go. You find that there is more to your life than you could imagine precisely because life has pulled you beyond your own imagination. Uh, there's some talk earlier about flow. Uh, drift is the moment at which time and space begin to liquefy and one begins to give up control over that, but in that sense experience it in a new way. And by the way, there, there's a great tradition here, the French concept of the flaneur, the urban idler, the urban wanderer who knows the city in ways that those of us who keep the same routes every day uh, don't. Or the French philosophical concept of the derive, the idea of intentionally getting yourself lost. If you're a longtime Pittsburgh resident, you might sometime try just wandering until you're lost. And what the guess is, you'll find a whole new city out there. You'll find a city that you couldn't have imagined nor found if you looked for it precisely because you're not looking for it. And so the idea of drift is the way in which these uh, and other drifters live. And that is, again, the idea of living on the move, not to run away from something, but actually finding one's home where there's no home, uh, finding one's identity in the fluidity of changing circumstances uh, and this sort of thing. So I'll end with uh, a quote from one of these drifters who went on to write a book. He was a gutter punk, although he's anonymous, so I won't tell you who he is, but we have our 
We have our guesses. Uh, and he, he argued at the, at the end of his book, he said, I always look forward to things not going the way I planned. That way I wasn't limited by my own imagination. That way anything can and always did happen. To me, that is the spark of trash cans, the spark of trespass, and the spark of being adrift. Thank you.